Hi, my name is Christelle Quizera. I'm a Rwandan. I'm 27 years old. Um, I was born in the northern part of the country uh, in Musanze. And uh, as a young person, we lived in Kigali. So I grew up in Kigali. I uh, went to school uh, within Kigali. I was at Apakop Primary School, then at Lycée Notre Dame de Cito. And then later on, I went to Kigali International Community School uh, to finish my high school. Uh, afterwards, I received a scholarship to go study at Oklahoma Christian University, uh, which is where, uh, when I was around, I actually founded my company from there while I was still a student. Um, I started Water Access Rwanda to address two main issues that I saw um, happening in my community, one being youth unemployment and the other one being the water crisis. So we actually have a very simple mission to address um, the water crisis while creating employment for young people. So employing young people as solution providers uh, to the water crisis. Uh, all our solutions in the company are made to be simple, affordable and durable. So we look at available technologies within the water sector and we find ways to distribute them at scale uh, within the African rural parts, especially for the bottom of the pyramid. So that's why affordability and durability is a big part of what we do. When we started, it wasn't always like that. Uh, we were doing hand pumps, which tend to break, uh, be really uh, expensive to maintain. Uh, but now we're doing piped water. So we're doing piped water through rural water mini grids called Inuma, which delivers safe water right into people's homes. Uh, in more urban areas where people already have piped water, we're helping them save uh, rainwater, harvest and save rainwater um, in a way to also reduce their bill uh, in the rain season. As you know, in Kigali, it's a particular challenge. Uh, people don't harvest rainwater, so there is a lot of runoff, a lot of um, um, flash floodings in the valley during the rain season. So that's something we can stop as urban residents by harvesting more rainwater. And it's kind of strange that we don't do it because rainwater is free water from the heavens. So there is a lot of myth and um, misunderstandings about the safety of rainwater. So we're trying to fix that uh, through our Mazi portal where people can purchase uh, first flash diverters and uh, point of entry filtration systems so that they can trust every tap in their homes, whether they're collecting wasak water or rainwater. So with this, we hope that in the rain season, people's bill uh, on water is going to go down to almost zero because we receive enough rain uh, in Rwanda to, to be able to use it for everything. Um, we also do irrigation products. Uh, so for farmers, we have two versions. One is called Uhira, where we finance farmers uh, over 12 uh, months uh, to receive a, a water point feeding from a borehole source. So they get a borehole, a solar-powered uh, solar um, water pump, and a tank, and irrigation uh, uh, fixtures. Uh, we also have Ijabo, which is also an irrigation mini-grid. So with Ijabo, we go to smallholder farmers who live uphill, so they're nowhere near a lake or a swamp. So they really, until we intervene, their only irrigation uh, option was if it's raining. So with them, we provide them a irrigation service that they share among different farms. So we install a system and then farms up to 25 farmers can share one system and they only pay for the water they use. So they don't have to worry about coming up with the capital for the water point. So um, I think that's what we do. As a company, we're highly committed on employment and employing young people, uh, especially empowering women within uh, a technical field that we're in. Uh, right now, we have 61 employees. 48% of them are women. Uh, and we have an average age as a company of 29 years old. So we try to keep it young, keep it inclusive, so that we drive innovation and um, flexibility within what we do, within um, the, the interventions we make. We don't want to necessarily be the old company that does things traditionally. We want to always be pushing the boundaries uh, because right now, when you look at the solutions in the sector, they're mainly targeted at the rich and powerful. Um, in a way, uh, within Africa, it's all top of the pyramid designs. So somebody who lives in a well-established settlement like Kachiru or Nyarutarama, their water bill is going to be super cheap. But if you live on the outskirts of the city in uh, unplanned settlements, your water bill is very, very high. 
because most of the time you don't have reliable water. So, um, and then when you go to rural areas, people don't even have enough money to afford their own water point, but yet that's where they end up paying more for their water. So we're trying to push boundaries and see, can we design market fit solution for the bottom of the pyramid, the people who have to work to earn any money and who earn less than $5 per day, uh, even less than $1 sometimes. So all our solutions are made to be affordable. The Global Citizen Prize Cisco Youth Leadership Award is awarded to a young person who's changing the word uh, uh, fighting poverty in, in, in new ways. Um, it's been such a huge honor to be selected this year, first as a finalist and then as the winner, because so many people around the world submitted their solutions to global poverty issues, uh, and they're all doing amazing work. Even when you look at the other finalists, they're all doing very critical and amazing work. So to be selected as an overall winner, first of all, is a big blessing to us. It's a huge catalyst towards our future goals. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's quite a huge commitment by the global leaders and the people involved with Global Citizen. Because as we like to say, water is an enabler. Water is a basic human right. Um, it's, it's something we need to survive as humans next to air. Once you have air, you also need water to be able to live as a human being. So it's quite a modern tragedy that over 2 billion people worldwide cannot access uh, that basic necessity in a convenient or accessible way. So it's something that requires fixing urgently if we are going to develop as a common word, as, as global citizens of one word. Um, and we need solutions in the water sector that look at the poor, the bottom of the pyramid, people in rural areas, people who are hard to reach. Um, and I think it's quite a testament to the work that we do and especially the vision behind it, uh, which is within pushing boundaries to service the poor, with market viable solutions because as you see the way the fi financials move, um, a lot of market driven solutions are better, they're always better funded than public or social projects. So if we can design something in the, uh, in the um, market that can be market driven, so if you do this you gain a profit for yourself and you're gaining a profit for the people you are servicing, so kind of a triple bottom line where your solution affects planet, people, and generates profit. As we design such so solutions, they have a huge, huge potential for scalability and impact, which is what, um, what is exciting about what we do. And um, I believe the Global Citizen Prize, uh, sponsored by Cisco, really emphasizes the importance of that work. So we have a vision to be in 12 countries by 2030 where we will have uh, uh, over 30 million people receiving water from one of our water points. Um, and beyond those 30 million people, we have created 13,000 permanent employment. Uh, and the way we create jobs in water access, right now, it's decent work. So we, we never, we count the temporary workers, but they're not our focus. We want the people who can receive an income, get pension contributions and medical contribution from their work so that they don't just earn an income but their overall over life is improved and they're able to get quality health care and have an assured uh, pension plan from having been involved with us as a company. So that's the plan we have in the next uh, 10 years. We're planning to go into the DRC, Central African Republic, Cameroon, Angola, Mozambique, Nigeria. We're really excited to be in countries where uh, you have massive rural areas, massive populations in the rural areas and where infrastructure is not moving as fast as it should be to meet the needs of the people. So we want to be in those countries and provide uh, affordable water uh, to, to the communities there. So as a woman uh, in, the, in the water sector in a technical field, I study mechanical engineering. Um, so I'm used to being a minority or the single person in a room and it's something I'm trying to change. Uh, one of the things that makes me mad or not just angry though because it moves me to action is to see how little of the world's resources going through women's hands. Uh, for example, um, women, are very, women in Africa are very active in the informal economy. They start the most businesses. Uh, they're the ones who are selling in the market, they're the ones doing most of the work. Yet when you go to the formal economy, so registered businesses earning 
uh, bigger revenues, paying taxes and all that, you don't find uh, women represented as much. And this has to do with natural barriers that women have, especially given the history of disenfranchising uh, women um, and inequality that, that has dominated the world um, in the past. Um, women don't control that many assets, that many resources. Um, and so it's something I'm trying to change. But beyond just the control of assets, there is a huge bias, uh, a huge confirmation bias still found within the investment community where most investors are still men, uh, most investment, uh, over 90% of investment is going to male-founded ventures. It's quite a shock to realize that since the, I don't know, since we started tracking these numbers, only 90 women, 90 women of black, black women founders have ever raised over $1 million in capital. It's a shame. It's a very bad number. Uh, just to give you comparison, I think in Silicon Valley, just this year alone, over 3,000 companies raised over $1 million. So women, just 90 of them worldwide, have ever been able to raise um, $1 million. So it's something we need to change, and it's changed by uh, people like me, other women entrepreneurs, being bolder in their vision and their uh, enterprises. But also, um, you meet barriers. So once you start raising, you also realize the bias is there because no investor makes an unrisky investment. Every investment is risky. But what do you do as an entrepreneur, as a company, to convince that investor that you are the right risk to take? Um, and unfortunately, there you meet a confirmation bias because uh, women are perceived negatively uh, for, for traits that men will be perceived positively on. So, for example, if a man is inexperienced, uh, he will be called promising uh, by the investors. But if a woman doesn't have the same level of experience, um, they'll, they'll call them inexperienced or uh, without the right advice. Or, you know, th th it's seen negatively versus with a man it's in a little bit uh, more positively. If a woman is very ambitious uh, with the plans they have, um, a man it will be like, they're very bold. So it's seen as a, it's a good thing. They're ambitious, they're bold. Uh, but if a woman uh, is doing the same thing, uh, they, it's being more seen negatively, like they are uninformed or they're crazy or you know their ideas are not informed or, or things like that. So it's something we need to change. And unfortunately, it's not just with investors, partners, uh, supply chains. Uh, you find that major supply chains with the UN, um, US embassies across the world, uh, different big organizations across the world, they don't have that many women in their supply chains. So these spend a lot of money worldwide. So it's important that these kind of um, big organizations, especially that are funded by people across the world, are held accountable to at least have 30 women uh, owned companies within their supply chain. Because basically how much, you know, you have a program that's supporting women, but uh, all of their supply chain is men. So although their programming is supporting women, none of the suppliers, none of the money is going through the hands of women. So at the end, they end up promoting the same, um, the same issues that are in society. So if this uh, organization can take the lead, and be like, actually, within our supply chain, we're going to have 30% women suppliers or 50%, which will be much better. 50% um, women suppliers, then we will see more resources, more money going through uh, women, especially black women. So it's something very, um, very important. And I see people are being awakened to these numbers. At least many companies are starting to track how they involve women, not just in official positions, uh, like boards where you see major, major companies saying we're going to have at least um, uh, women on our board and we're not going to work with any company where there's not at least one woman on the board. You would be surprised how many people get affected by such decisions because so many companies don't include women. Um, and next is now, okay, we have women in leadership positions. Can we have women receive money from us, from our supplies? Uh, can we actually vet good companies out there run by women that will be part of our supply chain? Um, and of course, when this happens, you have the confirmation bias that, oh no, women companies are not doing it or they're not doing it as well as the men. And that's something to challenge. And 
hopefully as people set such targets, then we can uh, question and, um, that confirmation bias because people usually, it's in our minds, right? Even when you ask, even if you ask me, like who are your role models? Uh, I'm even surprised how many of them are men. Uh, but it's the world we're in right now. So if somebody is trying to peg me against, you know, am I going to be the next um, unicorn entrepreneur, right? Uh, they don't have that many examples of females uh, becoming big entrepreneurs, right? They, they, they have very few examples. So, but then you have Mark Zuckerberg, you have Steve Jobs, you have Bill Gates, you have uh, Jack Ma, you have Strive Masiwa, you have, you know, all these self-made uh, billionaires uh, who, you know, you can look up to, you can be like, wow, they made it. So if you see a young person who reminds you of Bill Gates, you're going to invest in them because you don't want to lose out. If you see a young person who looks like, uh, you know, Strive Mas, you are going to invest in them. So how do I, as a female entrepreneur, look like those? Because I lead differently. I am a different person. Uh, and people are always going to sometimes see my gender before they see my worth. So it's something um, that I hope changes. It's not just women in Africa, it's women in the world. Um, and I hope we make progress. Um, one, Africa is actually a little bit ahead in terms of gender because um, women are, whenever they're given an opportunity, take on the challenge. Um, because we're having more homegrown uh, feminist revolutions in a way uh, where women in Africa have always had the right to vote, for example. Whenever we started voting, most countries, if not all of them in Africa, had women as part of the ballot. They, they never said, oh, women cannot vote. Uh, but at the same time, with banking sector, that was a little bit behind. So there is different things to look at. But in terms of the modern economy, the modern world, uh, women in Africa are being more empowered. Uh, so we, we kind of have a leap forward uh, on other women in the world, and uh, we need to take advantage of that. But uh, one of the ways we can still get support is to see more resources being driven through women's hands.